Tonight's top EU stories from the UNIT website include Portugal plans $4.3 billion of spending cuts in 2014 EU politicians clash over copyright levies European Union's common agricultural policy reform and its impacts on Africa. EU energy saving rules cut power of vacuum cleaners. Plus, the EU referendum bill could be the act that sank in sight of shore. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from our homepage, Portugal plans to cut spending by 3.2 billion euros next year to meet budget deficit targets as it tries to exit its bailout program. The 2014 budget was handed into Parliament yesterday and includes 1.3 billion euros of cuts to personnel costs. Finance Minister Maria Louis Alabuquerque told reporters in Lisbon last night salaries of state workers earning more than 600 euros a month will be cut by between 2.5% and 12%. So here is a conspiracy theory for you. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that the EU is enacting the vision of Jean Monnet to create a United States of Europe. Think for a moment how you might reduce the impact and influence of national governments and draw greater and greater power to the centre. Well, one idea could be to introduce a set of fiscal rules based upon some flaky economic theory that placed an absolute limit on debt-to-income ratios, forcing national governments to reduce spending. Of course, reducing spending means reducing government. Now, interestingly, the economists that propose the GDP to debt ratio based upon spreadsheet predictions of economic Armageddon have, of course, subsequently admitted on record that there was an error in their spreadsheet and that the breaching of those limits need not bring forth the four horsemen of the fiscal nemesis as first thought. An EU proposal to place copyright levies on cloud computing services would be a complete disaster if implemented, according to a member of the European Parliament. Pirate Party MEP Christian Engström said Tuesday that he could not envisage a proposal worse than that of the French MEP Francois Castex, who presented her plan for the overhaul of the copyright directive to the Parliament's Legal Affairs Committee on Monday. She said her proposal will make the issue of copyright levies and downloading clearer across the European Union. The very principle of levies is all wrong. We should be reducing them, not increasing them, Engstrom said in response. Well, it's interesting watching the state machinations as it tries to nail down and control the internet. And let me assure our viewers that the current internet as we know it will be controlled, legislated, regulated, blocked and monitored. Governments cannot function and exercise control over a hive connected people. Now, if you think I'm being dramatic, then go and search our legislation section for the keyword internet and see for yourself. There is already more regulation and legislation than you can shake a Eurocrat by the throat at. But watch what happens in the real world. Take, for example, the Working Time Directive and EU employment laws. The result is that businesses have disbanded their staff en masse in favour of independent contractors or zero-hour contracts. David Cameron was crowing earlier this uh, week that 400,000 new businesses had been registered in the UK. The greatest majority of these are not fully functioning businesses employing people. They are one-man band independent contractors who have set up because they've been turfed out of employment as a result of EU work and employment directives, licensing and, of course, forced austerity to meet national economic rules on a broken spreadsheet. <laughs> The European Union has recently reached an agreement within the Common Agricultural Policy for the upcoming period of 2014 to 2020. These cap negotiations are being made in conjunction with the multi-annual finance framework, which determines how much European money is allocated to agriculture every year. The International Centre for Trade and Sustainable Development informs us. 
Well, in the coming period between 2014 and 2020, the MFF agreed upon by the Council and the Parliament, the allocation to agriculture is expected to decrease, but not by a significant amount. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting article, but it needs to be considered in con conjunction with all the financial support and aid being provided to Africa for it to really make sense. Now, my first comment is on the line agreed upon by the Council and the Parliament. So let's cut through the lies here. What it doesn't say is that the cap is delivered by the unelected commission and then simply agreed upon. This is not the same as a democratic policy drafted transparently. However, the second point is that the amendments to the cap deliberately drive down commodity prices like milk, wheat and sugar by drawing upon African resources, which, if you recall from a few weeks ago, is exactly what we said all this interest in Africa was about in the first place. Britain's domestic vacuum cleaners will become less powerful under European Union rules designed to cut energy use that come into force next year. New machines will be banned from having motors that exceed 1,600 watts from September 2014 and they will be limited to 900 watts from 2017. Currently, the average vacuum cleaner on the market has a 1,800 watt motor and some use as much as 2,200 watts of power, the Sunday Times has reported. Now, Linda Dykes, a professional cleaner who has appeared on the Channel 4 programme Obsessive Compulsive Cleaners, told the paper, the more powerful the hoover is, the greater the suction. Now, people who don't know much about vacuums don't think the wattage is important, but people who know about them do. What can I say? Uh, this is a clear example of the complete lack of a clue demonstrated by the buffoons in Brussels. Do they really think that a vacuum cleaner that is only one-third the power of previous models, with only one-third the effectiveness, will reduce consumption? Well, it won't. What will happen is that those doing the hoovering will simply use the machine for longer, trying to achieve the desired result. And therefore, the aggregated power draw will be the same. And in fact, there is reasonable grounds to suspect that it might even be greater. As someone closely involved in the parliamentary campaign to secure the Prime Minister's support for legislation in this Parliament for a referendum in the next, I fear the unintended consequences of Adam Afrihi's amendment to James Wharton's private member's bill. There is every chance we will not secure our objectives in this Parliament if the amendments were passed. This would betray the efforts of many of us, both inside and outside Parliament, who have campaigned hard to give the electorate their say on this important issue. And more importantly, it would betray the electorate itself. It's worth remembering the Private Members' Bill had a difficult birth. In October 2011, 81 of us defied a three-line whip to vote for an EU referendum. And a little over a year later, and after our campaign, which included two letters signed by over 100 colleagues, the Prime Minister committed the party to a referendum in the next Parliament after a period of renegotiation. However, it still took 114 Conservatives to vote for my Queen's speech amendment for him to commit the party to supporting the legislation in this Parliament, as now contained within James Wharton's bill. The Afrihi Amendment, no matter how well-intentioned, risks throwing away all that has been achieved. Private members' bills are liable to fail for a large number of reasons, which is why so few become acts. And so it is folly to add to the danger the bill is already in. Now, now there's an idea. Let's say Chairman Cameron wanted to find a way to stop an EU referendum. Surely he would never want to destroy the democratic rights of the electorate like that. But well, let's just say that he did then what better way to ensure plausible deniability than to get some backbench chump you've never heard of to table a private member's bill that fails and subsequently brings down the referendum bill at the same time? Now, I'm not saying that our politicians are lying to us and trying to pull a fast one. What I am saying is that our politicians appear to be guiding us towards a federal United States of Europe and disguising each step as having an economic purpose. Today in our video library, with all this talk of Jean Monnet, perhaps it's time we found out a little more about him. 
Whilst Monet's vision for an integrated Europe brought about by stealth as a series of economic steps, in his version it had a virtuous purpose. Monet understood that a people united under a single flag, a single parliament and a single nation would stand the best chance of securing peace and prosperity for the people of Europe. Monet was not, however, advocating a neo-socialist structure like that which has been built in Brussels over the last 40 years. Monet's vision was a broader spread of democratic power, with greater representation for each and every individual. By giving every single person a voice and allowing them to share their commonalities and respect their differences in a unified Europe that eliminates inequality and domination. Now, sadly, the European Union has deliberately constructed itself with inequality and domination built in, the unelected European Commission. Now, whilst we allow this structure to exist, there will never be unity and integration for the people of Europe. The more it exerts its control and dominance, the more the people will repel from it. Look around you today, not just at Portugal, Greece and Spain, but even here in Britain. There is quiet disdain, a silent irritation and resentment. These are the symptoms of division and separatism, and unchecked they will lead to social unrest and collapse. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon.